welcome to episode 8 of Dielectric Videos. So on today's episode, I'm going to be demonstrating my t a Slayer Exciter coil, which is essentially a rather simplified version of a Tesla coil. Now unlike most Tesla coils, this one won't throw massive sparks out into the air, but its construction is incredibly simple and it's something that uh, even a hobbyist electronics enthusiast can build quite easily. So I'm going to show you exactly how this device works now. Well, if, the, if it works, ah, there we go. As you can see, the light bulb is now lit, and as you can see, there are no wires connecting this bulb to any part of this circuit. There is a strong electromagnetic field being generated by an oscillating, uh, an oscillating signal in this circuit. Now, I'll show you in a few minutes exactly how the circuit works on paper, but the idea behind it is it is self-resonating, and it's with every uh, pulse of electrical discharge through this primary coil, the secondary coil emits a huge electromagnetic field, strong enough to ionize the gas within this bulb and light the bulb. Now I actually configured this coil to operate at high voltage, uh, running off of the equivalent of the mains voltage, because I wanted to be able to run it off a of power inverter. I will show you that with my camera by panning down below, and as you can see, it is in fact running off a Centec power inverter. This makes it a highly portable uh, form of Tesla coil, doesn't require a lot of extra components to operate, and it does uh, keep reasonable isolation from the mains uh, and from any dangerous voltage because the inverter is not connected to earth ground. Now, it's not just about lighting up bulbs, you can also strike small arcs off of it with a metal uh, pointer or a metal, anything with a sharp metal tip. As you can see, hopefully, well, I'll move the bulb away to decrease some of the loading on this circuit. And we'll so I've moved the light bulb away from the circuit, and now we are drawing very nice electrical arcs off of this. Now, as you can see, the arcs tend to be strongest around the middle of the coil, and they're not anything like you would see from a full-on Tesla coil, but for such a simple circuit, as you'll see later, this is actually pretty good performance. Now you'll notice the light bulb tends to come on occasionally, and what that's doing is it's limiting the current through the circuit by normally being a relatively good conductor, but when a large amount of current is drawn, its resistance increases and it, quelt, or it uh, suppresses the overload in the circuit. That's the result of a, uh, or a, uh, an electronic breakdown in the transistor resulting from the high voltage and the large amount of uh, current flowing to the base of the transistor when the feedback of the circuit is high. I'll explain it pretty much how that uh, feedback circuit works when we do it on paper. However, this circuit does not simply light up light bulbs from a distance and make little sparks. It can do a lot more than that. Well, a little bit more than that, I should say if I connect a MOSFET and an audio amplifier to it. Now let me make a few small configuration changes to it. I'll turn the power off for safety. And I will move this, uh, a few wires around here, connect the red to the red and the black to the black. All right, now if all goes well, I should be able to do something that might be kind of cool. I'm going to play a music file, and that music file is going to flash the light bulb to its beat. Now, I'm using music by Alan Walker. Uh, it was published on No Copyright Sounds, the YouTube channel, which uh, states in their about page that all music on their channel can be used free of charge by content creators in their uh, content. So hopefully, if, uh, if Alan Walker, if you don't want me showing this, uh, just send me an email and I'll take it down but I'm going to use your song Spectre to demonstrate the performance of the circuit. So here goes. Let me turn it on first. You'll notice when the power is on, there is no light here at the light bulb until I start the music. All right, I got Windows Media Player to comply. Now watch what happens when I crank the volume. <laughs>
All right, so as you can see, the Slayer Exciter circuit can be driven by a MOSFET or an amplifier connected MOSFET, and by doing that, it can be modulated. So, by using this modulated output, we can flash the bulb and do all kinds of other cool things. Now, before I get into the theory aspects of it, I do want to go over some slight safety considerations for this type of circuit. Now, when it's under its normal configuration and uh, the power is on, this can strike uh, electrical arcs in, that will actually burn your skin if you touch them. Now, you won't be shocked by the high frequency, high voltage side of it because the frequency is so high your nerves won't respond to it. But you can still be burned both externally and internally by it, and the electromagnetic radiation can actually have a similar effect to having the door lock bypassed on your microwave and being exposed to the microwave radiation that can cause internal burns. So if you're using a very high powered uh, exciter circuit, it's a good idea to take precautions and avoid uh, getting too near to it, especially with your face. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't, get, uh, you don't get any internal RF burns from it. So with that being said, uh, I'll get on to the theory next, and hopefully you'll be able to get some insight on how you might uh, be interested in building one, if you're feeling comfortable with the risks associated, of course. All right, so now that I've shown you the operation of the Slayer Exciter coil, I'm gonna show you basically the theory behind it. So really, all the Slayer Exciter coil is is a transistor oscillator circuit with an air core transformer connected to it. Now, to make it operate, you're essentially relying on this transistor switching on and off and on and off. The way it works is you have this uh, input voltage across the transistor connected through the primary of the uh, air core transformer, which will usually be a very, very low resistance primary, usually eight or, or somewhere between three and eight turns of just copper wire. This then is go will uh, flow through the transistor when the transistor is in the conducting state and back down to ground and return to the uh, negative side of the input. Now, initially, this transistor is in the open state. There's no voltage here uh, to make it operate. But as soon as the power is turned on, uh, voltage will flow and current will flow through this 100K resistor. The current will flow into the base, into the collector, and will switch the transistor on. So this allows a huge burst of current to suddenly start flowing through these eight turns of wire. And in response, another burst of current flows through these uh, roughly 500 to 1,000 turns on the secondary. Now, you might wonder, well, this is not connected to anything. Uh, what's going on here? Well, actually, the real uh, interesting thing about this Slayer exciter circuit is that it relies on the capacitance between the end of the Slayer coil and the entire circuit below. This is actually uh, per connecting uh, in a, through a very weak capacitive link to the ground, positive, and pretty much everything in the circuit just through the air. So what essentially happens is, when all this current starts flowing through the transistor, current will flow through this in the capacitive link, and will actually, if this is wired in uh, the correct orientation, will actually serve to counteract the flow of current through the 100K resistor. And counteracting this flow of current will actually switch the transistor off. By switching the transistor off, the field here collapses, and kickstarts it again in the, uh, in the next cycle, which of course will allow current to start flowing again, and the transistor will turn back on again. Now, the diode is placed here for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that you don't want this transistor to ever get reverse biased. If the output from this coil pulls it below the level of the negative rail, uh, you're actually going to have current trying to flow backwards through the transistor, and that can uh, rapidly cause it to deteriorate or be damaged permanently. Uh, so that's what the diode is. The diode also serves as a path to allow current from the negative to flow into this part of the circuit during the discharge cycle, which helps to allow it to begin oscillating. Now the real beauty of the Slayer exciter circuit is that uh, the resonant frequency between the primary and secondary coils tunes itself because of this feedback loop. In a traditional Tesla coil, the primary and secondary would be mostly isolated and you'd have to actually calculate the resonant frequency of the secondary based on the calculations of an LC circuit or an inductor capacitor circuit and then tune the frequency generated in your primary circuit manually to match that. Of course, if you can nail that and get that working, you can generate huge sparks and huge bolts of lightning that the little Slayer circuit can't do. 
However, the Slayer circuit is much simpler and doesn't require you to really do any uh, pre-calculation as to the capacitance or inductance of the coil. It does everything by itself because the feedback loop allows it to self-oscillate. Now, in my implementation, I actually used a voltage supply of 120 volts AC, which I rectified to roughly 170 volts DC. And of course, to keep it from catastrophically failing in the event of the transistor uh, drawing too much current, I actually added a light bulb to my circuit. Now, what the light bulb does is it essentially acts as a pretty good conductor when it's cold. But if for some reason the transistor starts rapidly conducting current, and goes into breakdown, which tends to happen because of the backfeeding uh, input here, it's actually relatively common, uh, the light bulb will begin to heat up. And by heating up, it actually uh, increases its resistance and thus limits the current through the transistor. That allows the transistor to come out of the, uh, the sort of locked on state and allows it to return back to its normal oscillating state. You don't actually have to have this light bulb, and really for low voltage use, like 12 to 24 volts, you don't need it at all. But since I wanted to operate mine at high voltage to get bigger uh, magnetic fields and bigger sparks off of it, I ended up needing to install this to keep the transistors from burning out. Also, I used an NTE51 transistor, which is a very high voltage transistor. It has a base to collector voltage of 700, uh, 700 volts. It's designed to withstand huge surges of electrical voltage. You don't really need a transistor that good. A basic uh, like TIP51 or any, any uh, basic NPN transistor will work if you're using low voltage. It's not really required that you use the NTE51. But uh, as I should probably mention, operating this at high voltage can present some rather severe hazards in and of itself. Not to do with the high voltage produced by this coil, but with the mains input voltage. If you have this tied to mains, the electrical sparks generated by this coil can actually provide a low resistance path through the circuit between the mains and your uh, spark collecting implement, uh, whether you use like a screwdriver or a pencil or something like I was, and that can be quite dangerous just because of the mains voltage. To do, uh, combat that, I actually power mine off of a power inverter because I originally built mine to be displayed at a, a, a show where I wanted it to be very portable. And as a result, I didn't want to have to carry a big heavy transformer or DC power supply along. I wanted to be able to drive it right off the inverter, which is why I designed it with this light bulb and the high voltage. If you're just starting out building this, I strongly recommend using a low voltage power supply and not uh, exposing yourself directly to the mains or to a high voltage source like an inverter. That's just a safety precaution. Another precaution you'll want to take is the high uh, frequency electromagnetic radiation uh, hazard. You can actually get internal burns from this high frequency radiation, similarly to how a microwave with its door uh, switch bypassed can give you internal burns from the microwave radiation. So if you're going to run this at high power, you want to stay a good distance away, and if things start to feel warm or tingly, get away from it. Uh, additionally, if you end up touching the coil and drawing an arc from, to your skin, you'll get these little pinprick burns from the high frequency. You won't actually feel it shocking you because the frequency is too high for your nerves and muscles to detect, but the current can still flow with quite a great deal of power and cause you to get little burns on the surface of your skin. You know, these are less severe than the internal burns are, but they're still somewhat annoying when you're working on your circuit. So for best safety practice, it's good to avoid touching the circuit with bare skin and make sure if you're using high voltage that you don't actually come into contact with the circuit unless it's very well isolated from the ground. So I always encourage you to go out and try the experiment. Uh, because this is of a more hazardous nature, I have to put in my disclaimer again that you shouldn't try this if you don't know what you're doing. But after you've done the research and if you start out with low voltage and relatively small components, you should be relatively safe to go ahead and try it. Uh, if you have any sensitive electronics or medical devices, definitely stay away, however, because I have cooked a couple of electronic devices with this by accident. The high frequency uh, signal is really not very friendly to uh, electronic devices in its vicinity. But if you uh, are ready to embark on this project, you can find all the parts that you need at uh, online on some place like DigiKey or Mouser or at your local electronic supply store. So it's fun to uh, get started working on it and 
I encourage you to give it a go. Thanks for watching Dielectric Videos. I will see you next time.